Hello and welcome. The goal of this podcast is to get listeners connected with others in the sports industry because they say it's all about who you know, and now you know us. Hey, everybody. This is Connor and Callan, and you're listening to the Constant Sports Podcast, the show that is committed to connecting you with other sports industry professionals because they say it's all about who you know, and today you know Mackenzie Toll. Thanks for joining us today, Mackenzie. Of course. Anytime. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And to give the listeners and viewers a little background on Mackenzie, she is the founder, CEO of and player agent at Toll Sports Management. So in this episode, we're going to go from marketing, sports agencies, grad school, business, uh, being a female in the in the industry, and much more. So we're looking forward to diving in and and really just having a good conversation about those things. So if you could kind of start here, Mackenzie, give us maybe a little uh maybe not life story, but a little background on yourself and kind of how you got to where you're at today. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in a very sports heavy household. Um, both my parents played basketball. My mom is a basketball coach. My brother plays baseball at the university of Texas. So I grew up around sports. I played everything growing up. Volleyball was my main sport and what I played basically year round going into my junior and senior year of high school. And so I knew I wasn't at the level playing wise to continue um, my athletic career, but I knew sports was something that I wanted to still be a part of my everyday life. Um, Originally, I went on all of my college tours to um, more of like the sports broadcasting side of things. But once I found out that you kind of have to start off doing the weather and the local news and all of that, and I wasn't, you know, going to be starting off on the field first day. I kind of pivoted from that career path and went more into just the general sports administration, sports management type of major, which is what I majored in at Ole Miss, Um, got my bachelor's of sports administration, and then I minored in business. I actually graduated in three years, not really by choice. That wasn't originally my plan, but I went in with 21 hours of dual credit classes from high school that transferred over. Um, at Ole Miss, which then put me a whole year ahead of schedule. So since I knew that I was going to be graduating early, it made me have to kind of figure out my career path a little quicker than what I had planned. I knew the sports law side of stuff was what I kind of wanted to do down the road. I was very interested in the sports agent route, very interested in like the scouting and recruiting, Um, having, you know, traveled my whole life with my brother's baseball, having gone to Team USA events, perfect game events, you know, area code with the Texas Rangers all over, played for the Kansas City Royals scout team, things like that. I knew my connections, whether it was front office and coaching wise or whether it was player wise, was going to be extremely beneficial to me if I kind of went down that route. So, like I said, the sports agent dream wasn't immediate necessarily. I wanted to work in the front office for a major league baseball team. I wanted to pursue baseball ops, you know, GM roles, that type of thing. So once I graduated at Ole Miss, I had applied to Arizona State Master of Sports Law and Business, got accepted into there, took the LSAT to decide if I wanted to go for the, you know, full on JD, if I wanted to just do the master's pros and cons to both, I ended up, you know, being like, okay, look, I don't have to have my JD to be a sports agent. I don't have to have my JD to, you know, be in the front office of a team. However, I knew with me being a female that my road to get into baseball would be more difficult simply given the fact that I did not play baseball. I could never say that I played baseball. I could say that I played softball, but you have people that are like, well, that's not the same thing. Right. Um, you know, I could never sit down at a table with a player and be like, hey, I played in the MLB. I have 10 years of pro experience. That just was not going to be a thing for me. So I knew that I had to take the extra step in whatever way that was. And for me, that was pursuing a second degree to differentiate myself from other, you know, employees or other people they may be interviewing during the hiring process and things like that. So I had done a ton of research of programs that I wanted to do. I looked into Pepperdine, Texas Tech, looked at staying at Ole Miss, um, Miami, a lot of those schools that have, you know, whether it's their legal programs or if it is their master's um, and ultimately decided on Arizona State. Best decision I could have, you know, decided on. It was the perfect 
atmosphere, given Arizona, that was something that I was like, okay, look, every single major league sport is within a 30 mile radius yep. here in the state. You have mm -hmm. spring training, you have everything you could possibly imagine right here. So I knew the connections would be, you know, more than I could even dream of and looked at the classwork. That was something that was really important to me as I was choosing school. I honestly love school. I would go back tomorrow. Um, I very much loved like learning about what I was going to be doing in my career. So all of the classwork was another reason why I chose ASU because I knew that, you know, my negotiations class, my professional sports law class, my branding and marketing, like those are things that to this day I use every day. In fact, um, a few months ago, kind of like end of the year, um, I was helping represent a client and we had a trademark issue come up. Um, there was another sport who had the same name, contacted us, sent us a notice about trademarks. And thanks to my trademark class at ASU, uh -huh. I then was the one that handled that whole entire thing and still kind of to this day was the one in charge of it. You know, it was like, hey, we have a trademark issue. What do we do? What are our rights? What are, you know, all of the things, sending back the legal notices, talking to their legal team, ours. And that was something that I never would have known trademark rules and oh, yeah. laws if I had not have done that in school. And so best decision ever. Um, then graduated from ASU with my master's in sports law and business in one year, and then went from there was into the real world. So that's kind of my educational background and what got me kind of to where I'm at now. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, I mean, I completely agree with you because obviously Connor and I both went to the ASU program as well. Uh, <laughs> <What's up? laughs> being kind of um, a central hub with all the major sports. And then obviously, um, you had the goal to get into baseball and spring training and everything being there is a huge plus. Um, kind of related to that, before we really jump into your career that you're at now, uh, you mentioned you always wanted to get into sports. What was it about baseball specifically that made you say, you know, you just mentioned um, you wanted to be a baseball agent. You wanted to maybe get a GM role on the baseball side. Why baseball as opposed to kind of other sports? Um, why was baseball the only one that really stuck with you deep? Yeah. So kind of the first and I guess most obvious answer would be given how I grew up with my brother, um, the connections I knew there and the fact that when I attended games, I wasn't just there as the sister. I wasn't just there because my parents drug me to games. I didn't you know, sleep in in the hotel on early morning tournaments or anything like that. Like I was always there and always talking to people. I as a 15, 16, 17 year old would like be talking to scouts in the stands, just chatting it up. And um, they would ask me, you know, where are you going to school? What do you want to do? And so I had always started that kind of process really before I even realized that I was starting the networking process. Um, you know, before I even knew what networking really was, I was already doing that without noticing. And so once then I started thinking about what would be not necessarily the easiest route, but what am I good at? What do I already yep. have kind of a leg up at? And looking then at baseball is like, okay, you know, all of these people, you have all of these connections, you know, the GM for the Royals, you know, this person. And it was kind of a very like aha moment. Like I could really be successful at this given what I have been doing for years prior to school. And so that was kind of then what kickstarted the baseball route. And then I would always find myself analyzing players in the stands. Like my dad and I would be sitting there and we would be like, oh, look at this player. Like, look at the way he hits, look at how he's pitching, um, things like that. In fact, um, when my brother was at Arkansas, I went to one of their fall world series games at the end of their fall season. And there was a pitcher who I'm um, good friends with, who I noticed in the stands that he was tipping his pitches. And I like looked at my dad and I was like, look at, like, you can tell when he's throwing a fastball, you can tell when he's throwing a breaking ball, like we should probably say something like type of situation <laughs> after the game, I was having to get to the airport. I told my brother by super quick. And I was like, Hey, look, um, you know, so-and-so is tipping his pitches. He's doing this when he's throwing a breaking ball, this when he's doing a fastball. And I was just there, you know, watching my brother, but I noticed it. And so I told my brother and he's like, okay, you know, I'll talk to him couple days go past. Um, my brother calls me, we're catching up and he's like, so I told our pitching coach what you, what you noticed in the stands. And so we pulled the player in, we pulled in like our media and tech guy, um, and kind of, we're watching the film back. And he said, we noticed it. 
like right off the bat, as soon as you pointed it out and wow. um, the pitching coach was like, well, I can say this is the first time someone's sister has <laughs> pointed something out. And so that was always kind of a funny story that I think back on of just like little things that I always caught myself looking at it from a business and scouting standpoint, not just as yeah. a fan. And so luckily baseball really intrigues me with that. And I have a good eye for talent, a good eye for analyzing and scouting. And I knew then that that would make me super successful in the baseball route. And then from kind of the business standpoint, I mean, when you look at contracts, baseball guaranteed contracts versus some other sports, you know, obviously there's so much that goes into the negotiation process of what you negotiate in your contract, you know, not saying that NFL players don't get their salary guaranteed, but from like the CBA standpoint, baseball has a little bit more benefit from like the agent side of things of what we would end up getting and getting paid. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think, you know, as all of us kind of grow in our career, finding what you're good at is one of the most important things, right? Especially early on, finding what you're good at. So obviously you've kind of gone down that road as you just outlined with the baseball and whatnot, but becoming a baseball agent, there's uh, some, some homework, some things you need to do before. So talk to us about the agent test. You know, we, we had, um, as you posted on your socials, you know, how much does it cost? Is it, you got to have insurance? How does all that work? Studying kind of lay it out for us. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of background of how I got to that point of studying yep. for the exam. So at ASU, um, first semester, I didn't work, just focused on school. Second semester, I got an internship with the Cincinnati Reds in their Arizona ops out in Goodyear. Again, Arizona making that opportunity happen. Um, sure. It was right after COVID. So things were crazy. It was, we were in the bubble. You know, I was tested every day. I wasn't allowed to do certain things. Very, very secure, but very thankful I was even given that opportunity, given everything going on in the world. So I started off in Arizona Ops and ended up getting transitioned into player development, which was a little bit more of what I wanted to do if I mm -hmm. stayed on the team side. So I started that process um, in January and continued kind of throughout the summer. Towards the end of May, after I was graduating at ASU, still working for the Reds, I knew at that point that the team side was not for me. I didn't want to continue on the team side. It was something that I'm very, very, very thankful that I got that opportunity and yeah. able to do it to realize that I didn't want to be on the team side because I either would have always wondered and been like, oh, what if I would have gotten in the front office? Yeah. But it was something that I had to get out of my system and work for a team, work on the player or the team side, um, but realize that the players, you were, you're working against them. And obviously, you know, the business of baseball, but you don't truly know it until you're working in it and you're having to have those meetings and conversations with players. And so I was like, okay, this is not, not something I want to be a part of my morals and values and being I don't know if it's the female older sister in me that was like wanting to protect the players mm -hmm. and wanting to kind of nurture them, not be against them because those are their careers and their life and their family. And like, especially I worked a lot with the Latin guys and seeing, you know, conversations that we had with them about COVID rules that we were basically lying to their face about just to not promote them and things like that. It's like, okay, that is, that's how they put food on the table. And we're screwing that over for our own greed and our own money. And so yeah. around May is when I was like, okay, I don't think I'm going to continue this. I'm going to finish out through the season. So I finished all the way out into November, you know, postseason baseball, but in May started in the process for then the player side. So I started researching the agent exam it's a pretty simple process. And I will say I'm only speaking from the baseball side. I did no research on NFL, NBA, mm -hmm. anything like that. I know it's somewhat of a similar process, but I do know like with baseball, you technically only have to have a high school degree. Um, whereas NFL and possibly the NBA, you do have to have like maybe your bachelor's, maybe even a secondary degree, not a hundred percent sure. But I do know baseball is pretty easy to just apply for the exam. So Given that I started the research, you know, you can basically just Google like MLBPA agent exam takes you to the MLBPA, you create your own account and register for the exam. So you fill all the application process out and then they give you um, everything you need to study, which I wish I had it here with me to show you, but I am a very note taker. I need to see it on paper. So I printed yep. it all out at ASU. <laughs> I probably don't. <laughs> 
some ink and paper after that one because it was a lot. But the binder was like, you know, this big. Oh, yeah. And it was the collective bargaining agreement, the joint drug agreement, the MLBPA, MLB rules, and then the MLBPA agent regulations. So all four of those big documents and rules and you basically just study that. And the MLBPA agent exam is offered once a year. It's usually in September. I think it is again this year as well. Um, in the past, before COVID, you would go to New York and take it there. So like at the mm. MLBPA, yep. um, when I took it because of COVID, it was on Zoom and online. Um, so I took it in Arizona in my apartment. Um, it's in pretty straightforward exam. <laughs> um, and they do a study session 24 hours kind of before the exam as well, where all everyone that's taking the exam gets on a zoom call with some of the guys from the union. They go over kind of the key points. You're able to take notes. And then from there on, you have like the 24 hour period before the exam starts to review what all you talked about and review your notes. Uh, if you study, <laughs> there is no reason you shouldn't pass it. However, I do know agents that have studied and taken it eight times and have never passed it. But the, I think kind of problem and the trickiness to it is that it's only offered once a year. So mm -hmm. if you don't pass it in September, you have a whole year to yeah. come up with something else to do um, or, you know, study again or whatever, you know, it's not like the LSAT or, you know, any exams like that that's offered in November and December and yeah. January, like where you have multiple options, it's a kind of a one and done thing, which is how I approached it, which I honestly think was a very good mindset to have in a sense that it motivated me to pass it the first time. Oh yeah, right. Uh, and it's not a cheap exam. I will tell you that much. So that in itself too was like, okay, I'm going to study, you know, my butt off to make sure that I do not have to take this exam, that I pass it the first time that I, you know, go into it a hundred percent effort. So I took the exam in September while I was still working for the Reds. Um, and then you get your results about like four to six weeks after you take it. It's just a pass or fail. Like there's a pass or fail mark, which I think is like 80, 85% is passing. Anything lower than that is failing, but you don't get told how much you pass it by. It's literally, you get an email that's like, you've passed your, like, congratulations, you passed your MLBK agent exam. You are now able to, you know, negotiate contracts with 40 man guys. And that's something too, that I will say for, you know, those listening is you don't have to take that exam. If you are only representing or working with minor league guys, um, you have to have that certification to negotiate or represent players that are on a 40 man roster. So that is something too, you know, if you wanted to start kind of your career and you're kind of working your way up. So you may have some guys that have just now been drafted or mm -hmm. are in high A or low A or whatever it may be. And they aren't necessarily to that 40 man roster yet you know, you could start building your client base and start building a reputation and working with them for a year or two, three, depending on how long, and then take your exam closer to when they may reach the 40 man. Um, however, you don't want to then them get called up and you still haven't taken your exam. And then you're like, okay, well, are they going to go without an agent or are they going to switch to someone else? Um, so luckily, you know, I plan that out in that way, but you have three years after you take the exam to secure your certification. So after that three year mark, if you don't have a player on the 40 man, you have to go back and retake the exam. Mm -hmm. um, so there is kind of some gamble to it. There is kind of some, you know, thinking it through and thinking about, okay, if I take the exam now and I have these players in three years, you know, will they be on a 40 man? Yes or no, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so I do know people that, you know, take, take the exam. And if they don't have a guy on a 40 man in three years, they take it again and just kind of repeat that process. But that can get expensive. And that can yep. obviously take a lot of time. You know, I studied May till September every single day. And um, especially now that the collective bargaining agreement has changed, it's new study material, there are yep. some changes and things like that. Luckily, 
Um, I took the exam right before all of that happened because then that was the next year of the lockout and when all the negotiation process was happening. So I took it in September and the lockout was in December and, um, that then changed kind of a ton of rules. And I had studied the CBA in school at Arizona state, uh, very, very heavily. So I was kind of ahead of the study game, just given what I had to do for school. And so luckily I was able to take that exam before things changed, but, um, you know, there's definitely, like I said, a process to it and having your, having taken the exam and passed it is a great thing to have, but you don't necessarily have to have it to start off your career. There are agents that I actually work with who have players in AAA that they have talked to me. Like if my guy gets put on the 40 man, you're going to be his agent. Like both of us are going to be on his player agent designation form because I'm not certified. So you have to have someone on there that's certified, but he also wants to be on it. So he mm -hmm. was like, okay, I'll put you on it. Cause you have your certification. Like you've taken the exam and passed it and it's still good. It hasn't expired yet. I don't have it. So I'm going to put both of us on there. That way we're certified and good to go. Um, and so I do a lot of work like that, where I kind of work with other agents um, when it comes to kind of using your certification to your benefit, using your certification to someone else's benefit um, and going through that process then of taking the exam and knowing when's the best time given, you know, your clients. So. Yeah, yeah I mean, that was obviously. awesome. Yeah. It's a obviously, lot. <laughs> yeah. You uh, obviously passed the exam, kind of got your career started. So first of all, congratulations on that. I know you've been doing it for a while. Um, can you kind of talk us through what was your process you know, once you got certified, what made you want to start your own agency with Toll Sports Management as opposed to, you know, the goal of working for a, a bigger uh, baseball agency that may be out there? Um, so kind of first of all, why do you want to do that? And then second, what are some, you know, from what you saw, what are some pros and cons um, from that experience? Yeah, so this is going to sound kind of crazy, but I actually started my own agency before I even took the MLBPA agent exam, given the NIL laws. So that kind of kickstarted me to start my own agency. So all of this in 2021, I was working for the Reds that season. The NIL laws passed in July of 2021. So we, you know, I had, whenever I was in school, there was a mentor that's on ASU's board who I talked to all the time. And he's actually one of the attorneys that was on the lawsuits with student athletes in the NCAA. And he had been telling me, he's like, Mackenzie, like NIL is going to pass. The NCAA is not going to win this case. He was like, they're going to start being able to make money off of who they are and their name. And in my mind, I was like, there's no way this is going to pass. There's no way the NCAA is going to let this happen. I kind of blew him off a little bit. I was like, there's just no way. Didn't believe him, but I had studied it a lot. Again, we talked about it in school. It was something that was very prevalent from like the legal standpoint and very, you know, we studied all the time and luckily had a lot of inside information and sources to it. So I'm working for the Reds. It's actually July 4th weekend, kind of when all this happened. I'm actually at the lake with friends and I get a text from um, an Ole Miss volleyball player at the time who she was like, hey, NIL's passing. Uh, we, you know, we're told it's about to basically go live and be public knowledge. We know what you do. We know what you're good at. We know what your goals are with the agent side. We know you're into marketing. Um, what are your thoughts of like representing me through the NIL process? I want your help. All of this. So I'm kind of like, okay, you know, I'm not home right now. Let me, let me do my research. Let me think it through. And so I got back home after July 4th and started the process of like, look, okay, I had her along with several other athletes in several different sports and several different schools had reached out to me in a few days time period. And I was like, if I'm going to represent them, if I'm going to help them with their NIL and their marketing and growing their brand and image, I need to do this from a very correct legal and time frame. You know, I need to make sure that I'm doing this correctly. And so I um, went about starting my LLC, went about going through the process of branding my name, branding my designs, all of that, and was like, okay, I'm going to start Toll Sports Management. Having my name as my last name, Toll, was something that was very, very important to me, given the female side of things and given that 
I, you know, wanted people to know that that was me, not just yeah. some generic, you know, whether you use Alliance or Jet or what, you know, there's all those kind of main names, but I was like, my name is very important to me. So I started that um, in July, along with then studying for the agent exam that I took in September. And so by the time I took the exam, TSM was, had taken off. Um, I got certified in the States of Arkansas and Mississippi for NIL at that time. Um, Arkansas because of my brother, Mississippi because of where I went to school and represented um, five University of Arkansas players, baseball players, and one Ole Miss track and field player within tens of people reaching out all the time of like, okay, I had some football guys in Texas, but the thing is with NIL, you have to be certified by the state. It's mm. not the sport. So it's completely different than how it is in a professional side um, that you're then certified by the state. And again, costs money, it's an application process. And so making sure that you are very, uh, you know, smart about that decision as well. You know, you don't want to pay hundreds of dollars in a state that you're not going to kind of get a return on your investment. Yeah. And so that was something that I, you know, didn't right off the bat, go get certified in a ton of states. Obviously, there are agents and agencies that can, you know, your Wasserman's or CIA, your Boris, they were certified in every single state the second the law was passed, whereas oh, yeah. people like me may have to then pick and choose. And so that's kind of how TSM started was it basically fell into my lap, given the fact that NIL had passed. And I started my business, finished out that year with the Cincinnati Reds, told them I'm going to go to the player side, pass my exam. And then since then, TSM has been up and running for, you know, two to three years now. And it's kind of crazy looking back on it. Like it TSM seems like I started it yesterday, but I have, you know, built a really good client base. I have represented guys, you know, professional guys. I represent minor league guys. I've worked um, in the Puerto Rican winter league negotiating contract there. I have several guys with um, the drafts this year and NIL. So um, it has definitely grown itself. And I know, you know, people ask me all the time, like, how do you get your clients? How do you choose what you're doing and who, who you're going to represent? Do you reach out to them on social media? Do you go watch them play? Do you talk to their family? And, um, you know, obviously there's a lot that goes into it with scouting or, and recruiting, you know, every single game I'm at, if I'm there watching my brother, I'm watching the other team as well. You know, I'm, always scouting and recruiting, regardless of if I'm somewhere for fun or for work. But a lot of it has been word of mouth, which I'm extremely thankful for, and which helps me as well, given the fact that I am a small agency, and I don't have, you know, a ton of employees or, you know, a ton of interns that I can send out and be like, go scout these 10 games, you know, it's kind of all on me to do. And um, so I, you know, really use the word of mouth and people always told me, you know, it just takes one just takes your first person that you sign and then it will, you know, kind of snowball effect from there. And that has definitely been true. Uh, you know, my first kind of professional guy that I represented um, was word of mouth was we knew a mutual friend, a teammate of his went to Ole Miss. He reached out to me. He was like, McKenzie's great. Like talk to her. And I started representing him. And then he told a teammate and that teammate reached out to me. And then um, the college side, like I got to know a a trainer kind of out in California who trains some guys in the summer. And he sent me, you know, 20 guys and was like, here, like start with them for NIL. And, you know, you have guys that are draft eligible or my brother played with them in the Cape and they want to, you know, become an undrafted free agent. And so, so many things like that, it just kind of opens the doors to, for me, but also, you know, I do have to pick and choose. I am just a one kind of person show. I've had an intern in the past um, who helps me with that stuff, but it, you can't say yes to everyone. You don't, you can't say yes to all 50 guys that reach out. And so that's something too, that not only do I look at talent, cause that's first and foremost, you know, I don't want to promise a guy that he's going to get picked up by a team. If he'd been released, if I don't think he actually has the potential to do that, or, you know, about representing a guy in the draft, if I don't think there's, you know, work to be done there, given the fact that basically, you know, you kind of know who's going to be drafted and stuff when that process happens. Um, and so kind of choosing the talent, but also who they are as a person, who they are, you know, on and off the field, do they, are they good at, you know, the marketing side of things? Do they have a brand that we can build and get them paid in other ways than just their player contracts? Do they, 
Are they a good person? Do they participate in charity events? Are they, you know, involved in their community and their school or their team or whatever it is? And, um, you know, having good morals and values and stuff like that is something that's extremely, you know, important to me, Mm -hmm. but also I feel like you can work and be so much more successful with a player that also believes that same way. And so that's kind of how I go about building my client base and then, um, letting doors open and close as they come. You know, Mm -hmm. I, definitely am a firm believer in that anything that hasn't worked out for me in the past that in the moment I may have cried about or been mad about, or, you know, was like life is ending. Um, that looking back now, I'm like, wow, like that, I'm so glad that didn't work out the way I wanted it to, or I'm so glad I didn't continue representing that person or working with that person or whatever it is. Um, that, you know, you kind of have to have that good head on your shoulders when it comes to your own business and your own, kind of demeanor and how you choose your clients. And um, then, you know, there's nothing that says that bigger agencies aren't better. And I think that's definitely something that as someone who is entering the industry, you know, to each their own on that. I personally wanted to do things my own way. I didn't want someone telling me who to, who to contact, who to represent, where to go, or, you know, how to run my business or my career. Um, I wanted to be the one, you know, completely in charge of that. Whereas other people may not want to have all that control. They may want to be told who to look for, or they may want to, you know, have someone above them or a hundred people above them that they can kind of mold their career off after kind of, you know, be an assistant to someone and just kind of doing that type of work. Or, you know, they don't care if the top person in the agency doesn't even know their name. You know, there's, when you get in with bigger agencies like that, I feel like sometimes you can get lost in the crowd, but I very much wanted to do the opposite. I was like, I'm going to build my own thing. I'm going to make my own path. And there's nothing that says one's better than the other. It really is just personal preference on that front. So how do you go about kind of choosing between which clients you're going to sign? Obviously, um, as I'm sure, and as you touched on a little bit, you can't really take on, you know, 50 different guys when you really started your own agency and doing a small thing. So what's your process of um, kind of either targeting clients that you want to go after or choosing different players um, that may come to you and, and whether or not you're going to represent them? Yeah. Um, so each kind of level of the sport, I think, is kind of a different process. So when it comes to, you know, your amateur guys, so we can even start at high school because there could be guys that I represent in high school for the draft. Yeah, that's right. How I approach them are going to be different than how I per- like approach a professional guy. So, you know, with high school and those younger guys, that main process is going to be very family oriented. Um, You're going to be talking to their parents are going to be, you know, conducting business on that front. Um, And I have had um, high school guys that I had phone calls with their dads or their parents and there were certain things that I was like, okay, this isn't going to work out for you and I, um, whether it was because of the parent or because of, you know, a lot of it has to do with outside things from that standpoint when it comes to high school, because most of the time, if I'm having a conversation with a high school player, they're legit. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to waste time on a high school player. <laughs> they're going to be drafted. Um, but there are things that I may not want to be involved in when it comes to that, you know, is their parent crazy in the stands or, you know, have they made a lot of scouts or, you know, your kind of perfect game team USA, those type of people, have they made them mad? You know, I interned for perfect game years ago. So I have no connections there as well that I'll kind of bounce players off of when it comes to that. And then with college uh, prior to NIL, there really wasn't a process for that. Now NIL has completely changed the game of how we go about scouting and recruiting because if you sign a player for NIL in college and you do a good job and you get them paid and you get the marketing deals nine times out of 10, you will continue that professional right. relationship into their professional career. Right. And so that is kind of something that you have to, you almost have to start thinking about the professional side while they're in college when in the past that, you know, wasn't a thing. Um, and so, you know, being able to look at kind of them in college as solely from the marketing standpoint though because you aren't signing players in college to represent them professionally you can't that's against NCAA rules um you are signing them as their marketing agent and obviously you can be seen as like an advisor for the draft or down the road but 
you are solely representing them based off of who they are, who they are as a person. Um, obviously when you have players that are good and their stats are phenomenal and they get these awards, they're going to be easier to market, of course. Okay. But you have guys that have built a social media following that may not be, you know, you're starting whoever. They may be third or fourth string or they may be hurt. I have, you know, players that didn't even play this year but have gotten a ton of marketing deals because they have, you know, 20,000 followers on TikTok and things like that. And so looking at high school guys in that way um, is very, very different when I'm choosing who to represent and who to help when it comes to NIL. Because also, you know, I've found a lot of success in representing players that are at schools in states that don't have a lot of competition. So like I said, you get certified by the state. So Mississippi, you have Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Obviously you have smaller schools like Southern Miss and things like that, but Compare Mississippi or even Arkansas, for example, Arkansas is the, you know, only big school in the state of Arkansas. So every single brand and company and mom and pop shop is putting all of their money into the University of Arkansas. Whereas right. Texas, you have Texas Tech, Texas, Baylor, TCU, <laughs> Texas State. you have so many big schools and your fan base is divided. You know, you may live in Lubbock, but you may have kids that go to UT, you know, that is something that I have then realized was like, okay, you know, to be successful also isn't just about the player. It's about the state and who you're going to be working with. Now, not saying that those brands and companies that are in that player state is the only, you know, people that I would reach out to, because that's not true. I would mm -hmm. could reach out to, you know, anyone across the country or the world, but you, I at least have seen a lot of success in partnering with those smaller companies, those smaller, you know, brands. Um, at Arkansas, I worked with, you know, a local nutrition shop and got all the players that I represented to, you know, kind of build their own drink and smoothie coined after their name. And they got a percentage of what they made off of it. I partner with a local jeweler and one of our players, his last name was Turner and he coined the name Turner time. You know, every time he got on base, he pointed at his wrist we made him a watch and he sold it as Turner time. Um, you know, all those things where, you know, you kind of think outside of the box and partner with those types of companies is then I think what makes the NIL side of things and who I choose to represent very kind of beneficial and successful. And it also makes it a little bit easier when you can look at a player and it's like, okay, Yes or no, do you want to post on social media? Yeah. That's like a big thing. Because I had even oh, yeah. a professional guy before straight up tell me, he was like, I don't care what brands come to me. I don't want to post on social media. I don't want to market anything. I just want to play baseball and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, that's totally fine. <laughs> but then you are going to approach them and kind of their career way differently than you're going to post someone that wants, you know, 10 different brand deals and has a huge following on social media. Um, so the college side is very much more looking at the player as who they are, not on the field, mm -hmm. where then when you start to get into then representing them in the draft and going through that process of whether there will be out, out of eligibility after this year or are wanting to go through the draft process with, you know, whether or not they may go back to school, you know, then that is way different from then the side of, okay, are we going to, you know, market them in a way that's going to get them seen from scouts are we going to market them in a way that's going to you know reach out to teams but you know we can't directly do that at that point if they still have eligibility so it's a very gray area from the college to the draft part of who I'm going to represent and what you know I'm going to be able to even do when it comes to that because we obviously are kind of handcuffed in the sense from the NCAA when it comes to eligibility and then once you go through the draft process and then into minor league and major league ball, like that side of it is then solely performance-based for the most part. Right. Um, now you may have some players that can get a lot of really good brand deals or some good marketing opportunities that I can obviously then take a commission off of. However, most brands on then that side aren't going to give deals to players that aren't good. You know, you're not going to have your players that have been released five times and played on 10 different teams and have gone from, you know, indie ball to this, to, you know, the Mexican league to then back here, you know, those players are way more difficult to kind of build that reputation with the MLB. 
Um, and so that is something that I have kind of had to pick and choose of from an even like a little bit more difficult standpoint, because, you know, I, I understand that professional baseball are these guys' careers, you know, that is how they make money. That is how they live. And so obviously as just a human, I want to help them any way that I can, but there does, you know, come a point where you have to have some tough conversations with them where it's like, okay, you know, you are 28 years old and you've only gotten to high A and even given now that the new minor league CBA, you know, increased pay, which is great, but teams don't like paying their players. They don't want to pay (laughs) any more than what they have to. So when you were, you know, reaching what they would consider more your older guys, you know, they're not going to pay a 28 year old in high A. They're that's a waste of their money. And so I have a lot of, um, indie ball guys and even kind of some like free agents, minor league free agents who reach out to me quite often. And, you know, that is something that I have to kind of put up this hard type of demeanor when it comes to those conversations that I can't just say yes and try to help them out because odds that it happens is probably very slim. Um, And it's just the reality of it. It's the reality of professional sports, but like I said, even more so now with the new minor league CBA. Um, and so that part of it is kind of the unglamorous, the not fun part. Um, you know, I never want to turn someone down. I'm a very, I want to help out everyone. I want to make everyone successful, but like I said, it's just me and I, you know, don't have the time and energy and money to put out for people in the, on the professional side that I don't see, um, becoming more of a paying client. So like when we say paying client, you know, the guys that are going to reach arbitration and free agency where I will then, you know, that's why I do what I do is for those contracts. You know, I'm not doing what I do for minor league contracts. I'm not making anything off of minor league guys. So um, the process of choosing is definitely, like I said, different given the level and the type of player that they are, but all of it just kind of comes down to, you know, the success of it and the mold of your morals and values. And are you going to get along? Are you, do you believe the same way? Are you going to butt heads with every single marketing deal you come up with as y'all don't agree? And it's a lot, it's funny to say this, but a lot of it makes me think of like a relationship because you are around them all the time. You are managing their life. You are, you know, even, you know, your older guys, you're, your relationship with their family, their girlfriend, their wives, their spouses, their kids. Like if they don't like you, the player isn't going to like you. Or, you know, if you are having to find housing for your player and their girlfriend and their dogs, or if you're having to, you know, all of those things that we do on a day-to-day life, you're managing them 24 seven. So if y'all's morals and values don't align from the beginning, it's not going to be fun, nor is it probably going to be successful. Yeah, that's that's definitely something that you want to you want to figure out early on, opposed to later. <laughs> that, that's for sure. And we, we've talked a little bit about kind of how you get clients, the marketing side, um, you know, the baseball stuff that goes into it. And as you've seen in your experience, what kind of skills have you noticed um, maybe that separate you from others or skills that you've picked up on during your time as an agent? Yeah. Uh, so I think one of the main skills that is extremely, extremely beneficial is communication. Um, That is like the number one reason that I have seen why players will fire their agent. They'll be like, I haven't heard from them in a year, or I needed new cleats and it took him three weeks to get back to me. Or I, you know, was seeing stuff on Twitter about a release or a trade or something. And I couldn't get a hold of my agent because they were MIA and not, you know, I'm finding it out on social media, not through my team or my agent. And so or even agents that will sign players, you know, they'll get drafted and then you'll never hear from them again until you are, you know, about to make it. And it's like, okay, that's not ever how I want to do my business. I don't want to be someone that just comes around for the payday. You know, it is, this industry is hard. It's hard for us and it's hard for the players. It is a grind. It is long seasons, long ways to ever make it. So many guys never make it. It's not yeah. like, you know, the NFL where when you're drafted, you're, you know, yeah, yeah you may be on like practice squad for a little bit, but like you're there. Mm-hmm. There's so many levels and years that it takes to get there. And that relationship is so important because, you know, if you don't like them as a person or like them as a player or can see anything, you know, coming about and being successful when they are, you know, at their worst, when they are in low A, when they are struggling, you know, 
then they're not going to want you around when they yeah. you know turn around and make it. And so that is something that I see a lot in players that have come to me before, like, Hey, I'm thinking about firing my agent. Okay. Why? And it's like, well, I haven't heard from them. Um, and so that is like the number one thing. And I, you know, make sure that I'm always checking in and checking in on again, their spouses, their girlfriends, like, um, one of my guys, you know, whenever he was going to spring training this year, I knew him and his girlfriend and their dogs were going to be driving from New York to Arizona. Okay. I checked in. I was like, Hey, how's it going? Like, where are y'all stopping? You know, safe travels. Like, did that necessarily like matter to either one of us in the grand scheme of things? No. Was I getting paid? Cause I texted him. No, yeah. but it's just the relationship that you build with them because you care about them as a person. You care about their well being. You care about their happiness and their family and their, you know, significant others. And that is something that I will always put, you know, at the top of oh, yeah. my, um, you know, resume of what I'm good at and what I will offer. Um, and then kind of on then the other side, that's a little bit more, I guess you could say technical, but like your organization skills and your, which communication and organization go very hand in hand. And that's something too, that like, am I, you know, going to get their equipment ordered on time? Am I going to ship it to the right address? You have players that are in many stadiums are getting moved up and down and you may ship it to their away stadium. You may ship it to their spring training site. And it's like, okay, a simple mistake like that, like, could you get something rerouted if you ship it wrong, if there's a mistake? Absolutely. But when, with this industry, players don't want any extra headache or any extra, you know, work that they have to do. You ship it somewhere wrong and they have to tell you, Hey, I haven't gotten it. Like they shouldn't have to be worrying about are their cleats going to show up or not? Which is why we even have a job is that we do all of those things for them. We do the behind the scenes thing. We do the grunt work. We do the conversations with teams when trades and releases are happening. Like, we, that is, we are the bridge from the team and the player and everything in between all that work is on us. And yeah. if you can't, you know, be organized, you can't communicate it to your player and things are delayed and not on time that you could have control over. And obviously stuff happens, but that will frustrate a player. And I, you know, have had players in the past. It was funny when I worked for the Reds and uh, built very strong relationships with a lot of those guys. And they would ask me what I want to do and all of that. And, you know, the agent side got brought up. They were like, honestly, if I had the choice for a female agent, like that would really intrigue me because they see it very much as like a motherly aspect, like a nurturing and caring. And when a guy, you know, can look at a female and kind of see motherly aspects in her, it it draws them to, you know, that person and they know that they're going to be well taken care of and things are going to be on time and organized. And they know that we you know have that aspect to us. Whereas like, yes, do I have days where I am very kind of a hard ass and I'm not in it for any emotions and I don't need any kind of extra drama? Like, absolutely. But there are some guys that don't ever have the other side. They don't ever mm -hmm. get the like emotional side. Mm -hmm. They don't ever have the caring side because they just have this front, like only business demeanor put up. And, you know, some guys don't like that. And so I think that that has, you know, been something that one players have told me. And then I've also seen it in my clients and in guys that I've represented before. And, um, you know, things like that, that that's something that I feel like I have to offer that may set me apart from, you know, a male agent when it comes to that. Um, and then obviously your, you know, normal skills as in like, do you have an eye for talent? Can you scout? Can you talk to players and their family? Um, are you, you know, can you type up correct contracts and emails? And when you're talking to brands, are you good at negotiating? Or when you're talking to teams, are you good at negotiating? Are you friends with the front office or does all of baseball hate you? <laughs> um, so things like that too, like I have a ton of relationships built with front office of teams, whether it was because I worked for them or, you know, whether it's through my brother or I, you know, sent my resume to them years ago and we had an interview and I've kept in touch or because I text them about a client of mine and all of those things like definitely goes into the skills that you have to have. Um, and then kind of just the perseverance and the, you know, persistence and, having a tough skin. Um, that is something that, you know, luckily I have always had tough skin. I'm very independent, very do things my own way. And no one's going to tell me, no, I've been like that since I was a child past <laughs> my parents. Um, and that was something kind of 
I realized as I was going um, through this career and as I was building my myself in this industry that like I had people um, at ASU, for example, like we had a one time like a panel of agents that came in and they were all male agents. And I'm sitting there as like a female and I'm like, okay, you know, whatever, I'll listen to what they have to say. And there was a question asked kind of about females and it came from, you know, one of us in the class and they kind of said like, you know, it's going to be really hard for you to be like an agent and a mom and a wife and have kids. Like, I don't really see how you could do that. And I got so pissed off sitting there. I was like, who are you to tell me that I can't do that? And, you know, as much as I love my career and love my job and love what I do, and that has my, you know, hundred percent undivided attention and effort towards right now. But like my next goal in life is to be a wife and a mom and have children. And like, that is, has always been a goal of mine. And I'm like, I, I will do both. And there's not a single like person or thing that will stand in my way. And I will, you know, be able to be super successful in my career in baseball, but also super successful as a mom. And that was something at ASU, um, professor Hooper, like I, was very drawn to her because she is a, you know, attorney, she's an mm -hmm. agent, she's a professor, she's a wife, she's a mom, like she did it all. And I was like, that is what I want to be. That is so cool. Like you go girl. And that was like, that is what I want to do. And, you know, you get told no more than you get told yes every day. You know, there's something else that's going to knock you down. You're going to have other agents address you as Mr. I get emails all the time, Mr. Toll, Mr. Toll. And I'm like, you know that I'm a girl, or if you don't know that I'm a girl, the fact that you have an automatic email coming, automatically addressing me as Mr. is yeah. not okay. Like, good luck. 2023, let's <laughs> kind of understand yeah. that not everyone that you're talking to is a, is a male. And, you know, you kind of have to let that just roll off your shoulders and take it with a grain of salt and move on. But it's things like that, that I will always, always like, push for, you know, the hard work and the having tough skin and standing up for what you believe in and not just, you know, being a yes, yes, ma'am, yes, sir type of person. Like I tend to have no filter and say what I think. And I'm very respectful when it comes to things, but I'm not going to sit there and let someone walk all over me or mm -hmm. just because it's a male who's been an agent for 25 years is going to talk down to me. Like we're all on the same level playing field, you know, just because yep. I'm young and just because I'm a female and just because I'm not, you know, working for some big agency doesn't mean that you're any better at your job than I am or that you're a better person than I am. And that's something that, you know, I'm encouraged boys or girls, it doesn't matter to always make sure you stick up for who you are and what you believe in. And um, that this industry is like super, super hard. It's a schemy, slimy business. You have people, you know, screw people over all the time. You have lying and cheating going on. You have, well, this agent doesn't get in trouble for anything and they break all the rules. Well, look at where they work and look at their name. Yeah. That's all there is to it. Yeah. I had um, someone ask me not long ago, they were like, how do you go about like the eligibility stuff with the NCAA and when you're representing players for the draft and how like, I know people will cover the expenses for them to go do like a team workout. And I'm like, well, technically that's illegal. That's not allowed, but yeah sure either they just get by with it which it only takes one time to get caught and that player loses their eligibility and you're forever mm -hmm. banned or two like who they are they don't get in trouble for anything and you just have that and and yes it's not fair and yes you're gonna have you know agents promising their draft guys cars and credit cards and all this stuff that happens every day that you may not be able to offer but at the end of the day like you are always going to run into that. And if you are good at what you do, if you stay true to who you are, if you do things the right way, the legal way, the, you know, at the end of the day, you will come out better than them. And that's something that I always have to remind myself that like, I don't want to be known as the person that is lying and doing things wrong. I don't want to, you know, be walking on eggshells every day that I might get caught by the MLB or the NCAA for doing something wrong. And um, you know, I, there are times where I'm like, okay, I, you know, kind of have a little bit of a pity party in the sense that like, okay, well, this is happening better for this agent. And I feel like I'm behind and I, you know, you, you have those days that everyone does in every industry where you're just like, man, this is tough, but being able to kind of be your biggest 
fan, your biggest support system, because especially in my shoes with me being the only one in my agency, like Mm -hmm. it's just me. I don't have other employees to lift me up when there's a bad day or when things are going wrong or when I'm unmotivated, like it is just me. And so, you know, that has obviously taken years and I'm not perfect at it by any means, but finding like the self-motivation and why I do what I do and that I, you know, love what I do. Like we said, kind of earlier in the podcast, like if you love what you do and you're good at it, like then you're not working. It's fun. Yep. You're traveling, you're meeting new people. You're going to all these cool places that you've never, you never would have been able to go to, or you wouldn't have had those opportunities and meeting people. And I think kind of the biggest thing for me was this past year at the baseball winter meetings. This was the first year that they had them in person since COVID. So um, they were in San Diego the year before that it was on zoom the year before that it was canceled because of the lockout. And I had gone back in 2018 and I was still a student. I was a sophomore in college. I was the youngest person there. I was there for more of the job fair for more of like as a student. And then this year was the first year it was back in person. And I was there as a professional in the industry. And I remember texting my parents like a couple of days into it. And I was like, this is so cool, but like crazy to look back on that students yeah. now are coming up to me and asking me questions and asking me for a job and giving me their business cards and their resumes. Whereas I used to be then. And yes, it was, you know, four or five years ago, but like how fast kind of time flies and when you can actually see like, wow, like I've made it in a sense. Um, obviously there's still so much I want to, you know, accomplish in my career, but I literally took a step back at the winter meetings and was like, wow, this is crazy that That's awesome. I'm now here as a professional when I once was here as a student. That's sweet. Yeah. That, that fired me up. I'm not going to lie. I'm ready to run through a brick wall. You know, I, um, <laughs> I yeah, I don't know what to say to that. The end, but I, I am curious kind of what's next for, um, for the agency. Do you have I guess player camps, do you do events? Are you signing people? Kind of what, what what's next for uh for uh, the agency here? Yeah. Um, so obviously right now is about the point where I start focusing on the draft. So mm-hmm. you kind of you get your guys going into spring training into the season. They kind of there's not much to do now that the season's going with like your minor league guys. Um and then you kind of are into postseason college baseball, you know, all the conference tournaments are coming up and then you'll go into regional supers and the college world series. The draft is in July. So this is now the time where you kind of start looking at that um, way more than what you had been. Obviously you have who you're going to represent. You have all the projections that we you know can come up with, but yeah. it's, you know, the guys that don't have eligibility left that you are able to do a little bit more for. You have the guys that, can't really do anything for and you just have to hope that teams call you you have kind of the process of okay where am I going to be on draft day am I going to be available for my players to call me am I going to be getting calls from teams kind of planning that um so that's kind of my next process is focusing on the draft focusing on what I need to do to prepare for that and then kind of also on the college side is getting guys ready for whether it's training this summer or going to the cave for a summer ball or, you know, getting them, you know, ready after their season's over. Cause some of them that season ends in a couple of weeks and some of them it ends in another month, but having them prepared for that. So anything that I need to do kind of on the college side now is my main focus. And then leading into then more like postseason professional baseball, then is when, you know, you have the trade deadline that starts coming up. You have then once the season's over, your free agency stuff starts and all of that. And so it's kind of a process of, you know, you focus on your college then you go more professional. And then in the off season is more like your scouting and recruiting time. But you have a different off season in college than you do in professional. So um, it's definitely like a year round type of, job but it kind of comes and goes in waves of when like my busy season is versus not and then you know with tsm i like i said earlier i have had an intern um she actually is starting at asu in the sports law and business program soon so she got into there and that was super cool um but now like i would like to hire you know whether it is an intern or someone that can do a little bit more of like the scouting and recruiting or the marketing side where i focus on the contracts and the negotiations and more of the legal stuff. Um, I definitely have like big goals for me personally. Mm-hmm. I have not had my 40 man guy yet. 
And so given the fact that my certification will expire soon, is like getting that 40 man guide to oh, yeah. secure it. Um, and then just like focusing a lot on the marketing and branding side. I know whenever I was going through school, like back at Ole Miss, I hated marketing to be completely honest. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do this. I just want to do like player contracts, talk to the team. That's it. And then obviously the past few years, marketing has taken off more than it ever has. <clears throat> and so being able to, you know, focus on branding that player and them coming up with their own brand and starting that process even younger for players who already have that established when they go into college for NIL and then into professional is like super, yeah. super important for players to, you know, focus on. And now that players have, you have licensing now and minor league baseball and you can, you know, there's way more now that the new CBA has passed it's something that is super important to kind of focus on. So the marketing side of stuff never really stops. Um, and then day to day, just like I said, managing their lives. So it could be anything from all a of it. Super big, all of it. Yeah. A super big negotiation with a team and a contract all the way down to they need help shipping their car from spring training to the season, or if they get hurt, they need to find a place to live mm -hmm. or, you know, you're helping their family or you're sending them, you know, Oh, Hey, I'm in a new city. I need, you know, cleats and restaurant recommendations, like everything to then marketing and branding to, you know, anything that you could possibly imagine, we manage, we do it all. Um, and so I think it's like being able to have someone who can help with that, whether it is an intern or whether it's another agency or agent, because a lot of us, we work together, we're under like independent contracts or memorandum of understandings or whatever it may be, where we work together. Um, and I've worked with, you know, super big clients. That I didn't represent professionally, but I was, you know, helping them with marketing. I helped with Cy Young players. I've done stuff with other agents. And um, so the day-to-day -day changes, I'm never stuck with just my clients. I'll have players reach out to me just to help them with marketing, even though I'm not their primary agent right. for like their playing side of stuff. And so the day-to-day changes and there's really nothing that I don't do. And I'm constantly traveling, constantly on the road. Um, luckily in the off season, like October to February, I'm pretty stationary um, other than the winter meetings, obviously, which is a week long um, where everyone in baseball is in one spot. And then other than that, like when the actual season is, I'm, I'm all over the place. I'd say the last like month or so I've been in five, six different states. Um, I've been to more games that I can even count. Um, there's a game I'm going to tonight, like things like that. And so just traveling and looking at players and meeting people and being introduced and handing out your business card and random coffee shops in yep. the middle of nowhere, like literally things happen all the time. And kind of like you said, it's not necessarily always what you know it's about mm -hmm. who you know and that is something that I was told literally freshman year very first class at Ole Miss that networking will be the number one thing you ever do and it's not about what you know it's who you know and this is why I do what I do and this is why I also like do these podcasts and reach out to people and answer people's phone calls and try to schedule as much of that as I can and answer questions because luckily I had really good mentors and people in my life as I was going through school and starting my career who helped me. So I'm like, if I can give even a little piece of advice or knowledge that helps someone out, whether it's, you know, helps them out from a like logistic standpoint, or even from like a motivation standpoint, whatever it is, like, if I can be that person that is, you know, that makes me successful. That makes me happy. That's why I do what I do. And whether it's students or players or clients of mine or brands, like I talk to people all the time and work with people and I just want to, you know, be as successful as I can from like a monetary standpoint, but also just from a good, good person helping yeah. people out and, um, you know, progressing their career because when their career progresses, it progresses mine. And it's mm -hmm. definitely a teamwork type of situation. And I love what I do. I love sports. I love baseball and kind of being my own boss has definitely been challenging, but it's something that I wouldn't go back and do differently. Um, I love it. And I hope that like, I can kind of leave this with anyone, you know, that you can, you can do whatever you want to do. You can be your own boss. You can start your own business. You can travel, you can meet people. And like, there's nothing in this world that should hold you back. If someone tells, you no, look them in the eyes and say, watch me and do it. And Start me up. Absolutely. I, 
Yeah, I love like when I like there's obviously females that'll reach out to me um that are like, oh my gosh, like you've helped me so much. I love watching what you do. I love watching, you know, other podcasts you've been on. I love listening to you because it can be hard and it can be discouraging sometimes. So having a role model to look up to, and luckily I had that. And, you know, I had people pave the way for me and hopefully I can continue doing the same for others who are in school or, you know, trying to start out their career or trying to figure out what their career is. So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's great to hear you say that. Obviously, (laughs) excuse me, you and I have gotten to know each other a little bit over the last year and a half or so, and everything you just said is correct. I kind of reached out to you because I've had a deep interest in the agency side and you've been super helpful. So it's been awesome to kind of see you take off and see things grow. Um, And you're obviously a very motivated person. So I'm sure great things are coming and we'll kind of uh, just wrap it up with uh, how can sort of the people listening stay connected with you, with your agency, whether it's uh, through social media and uh, yeah, we're just glad we were able to be the a platform where uh, people can can come and get answers to a lot of the questions that they send you. Yeah. Um, so connect with me on socials. Um, my Instagram is McKenzie underscore toll. As long as it's my Twitter, um, I'm on LinkedIn, McKenzie toll, Facebook, McKenzie toll, and, um, you know, connect with me on all of it. Toll sports management has its own Instagram. It is in the bio of my personal Instagram. So anything along those lines. Um, and then, you know, if you find me on LinkedIn or, you know, want to go into my DMs and reach out or whatever it may be, shoot me an email, text, DM. Um, it sometimes takes me a little bit to get back to people, but I try my best to reach back out to everyone, answer questions, even just connect, let them have my, you know, work number and stuff like that. That way we can chat and any questions, um, no questions, stupid question. I was completely lost at some point too, and had to have someone do the same thing to me. So any questions um, or even just to say hi or advice that I can give to someone, I am always more than willing to do. And I love connecting with people in the industry, whether it's students or other professionals. So feel free, anyone listening to reach out. And I hope um, that you take away, you know, some sort of knowledge or advice or motivation from this, because that's what I'm here for. Perfect. Yeah, we love it. And thanks everyone for listening and watching and this has been another episode of the constant sports podcast and today you met and learned about Mackenzie toll and we're excited to watch her as she continues in her career and uh, be able to connect others in the sports industry so thanks again for watching and we'll see you soon thanks guys see you